to, to get us started, we'll be talking about the logo that you reinterpreted for the Phillips Collection in celebration of the Phillips Collection turning 100 this year. Um, but to dive into that, I think it would be great to start off with a studio visit so that the audience can get a sense of your creative process um, and how that has informed and, and shaped how you designed the logo. Um, so thinking about your studio, I mean, you're, you're based in your, your physical studio, but you also imagine your studio as, as a digital space. Um, do you want to start off by sharing that with the audience? Yes. All right. So um, like many artists alive right now who are, as opposed to not alive, I work out of my bedroom. I work out of my house. So my studio is pretty much like a portion of my home. So I'm just going to show the portion where the, uh, the artwork happens. It's this. Everything that comes out of my brain and is processed in this location through these screens. Um, so that's my studio space, my mic and my, my Cintiq and my monitors. That's where everything is done. And um, that's the physical component, but really all the, all the guts of everything I do takes place, takes place in the digital realm. So I can show you all this right here. So this is, this is what it looks like in my, my digital space. This is Photoshop where a lot of my stuff is created. I also do a lot of work in Procreate on iPad. So that's my real studio space. It is that digital realm, you know, those in, inside this very flat place like we're in right now talking, so. Yeah, you know. yeah. Now the screen does sort of create this protective membrane that, um, yeah, can flatten things. But I, I think something that's so special about your work and that really resonates with me is your ability to not, only be crafting paintings or animations, but be crafting worlds. Like I think of, of your art as really world making in terms of thinking about where paintings live in the space that exists around them. Um, I mean, in, in some ways you could call it collage, but at times your paintings are these standalone pieces and then you put them in conversation either in a virtual space or in an animation or time lapse um, or or a different form of collage. Um, right. You know, you're gonna bring something up. That. And do you want to just talk the audience through how you are layering and sampling and pulling different elements to to create these landscapes? Yes, so um, I think the more traditional component of what I do is, is drawing, which is what you're seeing right now. This is a time-lapse of digital drawing done in Procreate. So you're seeing a time-lapse. And just now, when you see those little yellow portions, that's me sampling myself. That's me sampling my own artwork and just like stapling it to the drawing. Mm -hmm. um, this piece on the left, that's actually a Gauguin painting I took and then slapped onto my drawing and then I'm, I'm painting on top of it as like a stencil. And this is really like an essential part of, of how I create and how I think. I'm taking things, I'm repurposing them, I'm mixing them, slicing them and drawing on top of them and just doing it again and again, um, especially with my, my older stuff to kind of learn um, what is at the core of everything that I'm doing? Why am I doing these things? I think as I, as I sample myself, sample other artists I really resonate with, I'm trying to find those things that I share in common with them, everyone who came before me and um, what I share in common with my past work and my past self. Yeah, yeah. No, I love how you're really like siphoning meaning and finding new meaning even with, you know, work that may have been quote unquote completed. Um, yep. I think it's, you know, it's, you're constantly trying to refresh and, and you've described this process to me almost as, as a bit of like of a journaling process, you know, Absolutely. pulling different elements from your day to day life and you're mixing them in, you know, throughout this time lapse that we're seeing, whether right. that's like CO2 or. Yeah, like right here, this is a, 
particularly fun moment for me because I'm in this biology class and it's the most fun thing I'm doing right now. Um, I'll probably end up talking about that more later, but right here, um, so it's the go campaigning that I took and slapped onto here. And I was trying to figure out, I remember the day, I think this was um, Christmas actually. And I was trying to figure out a way to um, visualize carbon dioxide. So I was also thinking about the X-Men and like what if Charles Xavier was black and like all the, all the X-Men were black in fact. And I was just drawing them on top of this thing to represent CO2. But again, back to the journaling, this is a way right here for me to remember. And as I'm talking about CO2, it helps me remember and retain whatever, um, what my memories were, but also what I was learning in the class. Yeah, no, I love it. It feels like it's almost more in the tradition of filmmaking, even though you describe your work often as painting. You know, because painting in some ways, if you think of it in terms of film, it's it's just a time frame. It's like a right. still of, of one shot within an entire storyline. And you're really thinking about how painting can exist as, as a storyline or as a plot. Um, and it's, I mean, it's also, it's working and this feeds back into the conversation that we'll have in a little bit about the logo that you designed, but right. it, it's mimicking how history builds on top of itself, you know, in a very literal way, like our physical landscapes and how, you know, architecture and structure and roads and, you know, are all built on top of what previously existed. Um, really. and, I mean, and every, so every moment we're... Realize that that's our reality, that we're existing in these landscapes that have layers of history, you know, underneath us. Um, and your work really kind of does that, you know, unveiling where painting is like that too often, where there are these layers and, and different phases that a paint, uh, that a painting can go through, but it, we don't necessarily as an audience see it in that way. And that's the beauty of digital art is being able to excavate, I mean, the artist can excavate and show what was happening. You can show the sketch layers and the final finish layers on top of it. And like you were saying with landscapes, um, you know, with pandemic quarantine stuff, we all are spending a lot of time with ourselves and every moment we're existing in, I think, I think we're all really eager to be present. And um, I find that with my work, it's, it's kind of mirroring this feeling that as much as we try to think about the past or the future, we're, we're existing in moment to moment, but we are comprised of millions of years of evolution. This, in, in the same way our art is the same way, the things we create and consume are descended from millions of years of evolution and thought and influence and reworking and remixing, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good reminder that a, an art object or a painting or even a digital play, a piece isn't, doesn't exist independently. It's part of this continuum. As you said, it, you know, it's part of, um, you know, a whole host of, of histories before it, of ancestors, of, of an author, it's attached to a person, you know, it's not right. a standalone object. Um, no, that's really wonderful. I also, I mean, I think just to, um, again, before we get into the logo, the, the one other thing that I wanted to hear your thoughts on was, was also your relationship with gaming and video games and how that is yeah. also informing kind of this layering or this world making that you have within your art practice? Uh, to me, games are just, um, we're just a monumental part of my, my childhood, adolescence, and even now, I think it's, um, gaming has been so embedded in me that it's, affected the way I even process information. It's comforting for me to think about things in gaming terms. And with my work, uh, I'll show you. Recently, I've been developing my own game using the Unity engine. So what you see right here. Is this what you see right here? Describe to me. Yeah, this is the hub world. So my paintings are in here. This is the stuff I'm working on right now. And it's a game meant to again, process information and process my art. And I think my favorite work, the work that resonates the most with me and I think describes my brain the most um, is pretty much this, this unity stuff. I, I think it really describes how I tend to interact with objects. For instance, like in, when you play games, um, you walk up to an object 
you have a context menu, like you can look at an object, you can pick it up off the wall, you can talk to it, you can interrogate it. Mm -hmm. It's, um, and with, when you create a game, you sort of have this conversation with an art object about like, well, what are the finite amount of actions I can, I can do with this piece? I think, um, I, I can't wait to see when games are interacting more with art um, on a historical level, like future art, art that's being created now, because I think we can really make some super interesting things. For instance, like whatever your favorite painting is, like if you could talk to it and you knew that it could talk back to you, like what does that look like? I, that's what I'm really excited yeah. about. Yeah, I mean, what you're describing, it's, it sounds like it's it's discovering new ways to insert bits of intelligence, you know, right. almost, almost this weaving in artificial intelligence within the practice of painting, um, yeah. which is fascinating. <laughs> I think it'll be great. It's terrifying, but, but fascinating. Yeah. I, love, I, I cannot wait to, to speak to an AI um, painting or an Android that, that's an artist. I think that's just, it, it's terrifying, but I, I want to see it happen. So, yeah. 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 I mean, but also, I mean, for, for pretty much the existence of visual art, it's been very difficult for an audience to engage in an active way you know normally viewing a piece viewing an artwork is it tends to be a little bit more of a passive or introspective experience and right. so what you're talking about or foreshadowing is sort of this this ability to take things you know to to a different plane where we are able to interact um with different pieces of the art you know and just yeah it's it's very cool well why i think don't, it has why to happen because anyway, I almost want another future rat. Sorry, sorry, continue. Um, why don't we get into your logo? The logo, yes. Philip's collection. Graciously so, asked. Right, I'll let um, Miguel or Haley jump in and describe a little bit more about this entire series. But the premise, at least how, how I understand it, is that the Philip's collection has invited um, 12 different um, local local artists or, or artists that are based around the, the DC area right. um, to reimagine what the logo could be for the Phillips um, in celebration of their centennial. Right. Um, and so Dom, um, you know, it's, um, it's so exciting. You were selected as the first artist to be, um, to reimagine this and I think, so right now what the audience is seeing, do you want to describe they're seeing the process of, of you thinking about how you wanted to reimagine the logo? Yes, so I went through a, a couple of iterations for how I wanted to approach this. Uh, initially, I thought about doing something with a bunch of my original drawings and characters talking to each other inside of the work. But as a person who loves sampling, who loves good art, I, I rarely get an opportunity to officially work with existing amazing art without having to worry about things like copyright or being chased by the copyright police and all that stuff. So this is, I mean, the Phillips collection just has fantastic, amazing catalog. And I, I knew that I wanted to do something with the amazing catalog that exists there. So in my head, I imagined something where the centennial was, was basically you being able to see every painting, every piece in the Phillips collection, going from the, the first uh, acquired piece by Duncan Phillips to the most recent acquired piece. So with that, I sort of approached it like a curator. Um, what you're seeing here is the, the time lapse of me selecting my, my favorite pieces that I want, not my favorite pieces in the collection, but the pieces that I wanted to put inside of the 100 and inside mm -hmm. of the Phillips and eventually I, I played with putting characters on there and made a neon sign, neon animated glowy thing around it to sort of add some motion. Yeah, yeah. And the, the four pieces that we're actually seeing now that you selected, they yes. span four different centuries. I mean, I think the right. first one that you selected is from the 18th century. Yes. Uh, the next one, um, I believe is the Renoir is from the right. 19th century. Then we have Jacob Lawrence from the 20th century. And then um, one of the more recent acquisitions 
from the 21st century. Right, um, yeah, yeah, Holstein, exactly. Um, and so we have it chronologically and, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just, is, is there, and when you were like kind of approaching this with a curatorial eye, was there a reason? I mean, I love how you've kind of incorporated four different centuries within this one image. I feel like that also speaks again to this understanding of how to layer and collage time and collapse that space into one and have it they have the past coexist with the present. Um, I feel like that's very much your aesthetic, um, yeah. which I love. But is there, you know, you approaching this design, as you said, from a curatorial lens, was there a reason that you selected these four paintings? Definitely. I, I think on the most base level one um, level, I just approached this thinking about color. I, I knew I needed something that I, I tend to play with cool and hot. So I, I knew I wanted a, a cool color palette, which is why I, I chose these paintings. But on top of that, um, on top of that, I knew that thematically, I wanted to go from you know, the, the work that I was taught to taught to sort of idolize and memorize when I was an art history major. I'm, I'm sorry, a studio art major in UMD. Uh, very representational, very like traditionally white art, uh, Western European tradition. That stuff is, it's, it, I think it's very much embedded in my artistic DNA, but I put it sort of to the left to mean that this is, this stuff is 18th century, 19th century, all the stuff that I was taught. And there's stuff on the right that I find is very modern. It's very black, it's very contemporary. And the stuff that is also deep in my DNA and what I think of as my present and my future and the stuff that I'm super duper excited about seeing fill up more of the Phillips collection and more of all our, our favorite museums. So thematically, that's what I was thinking about a lot too. Mm, yeah, no, I echo all of what you just said. I also, I, I think that, that another common thread that ties between all the paintings that you selected is that, you know, each artist in their own way was a real masterful, masterful storyteller. And I think that goes again back to your own ability as an artist to be thinking about, you know, not just creating an aesthetically beautiful object, but creating an entire narrative. Um, so I, you know, feel like there's a lot of integrity between those selections and also um, your own artwork or your own art practice. Um, I also, I wanted to hear a little bit more about um, the neon and like your selection uh, of like why you decided to do um, a kind of a, a riff on what like a, a neon sign was, you know, cause the neon, yeah. it, it, there's a very particular aesthetic, you know, it conjures sort of city lights or nightlife um, or just, you know, Times Square even. Um, right. is, is there like, will you just tell us a little bit more about that design decision? You know, if this is something I discovered uh, probably when I was right out of college and learning how to animate, there's just something about flickering strobe lights that is just really um, aesthetically appealing to me. I grew up in Brooklyn and um, when I was a kid, there was something about how, how light worked in New York that was pretty obnoxious to the eye to have to witness as a kid. I think it was probably burned into my brain, but even now, like watching watching series like The Deuce about, um, specifically about New York and Times Square in like the uh, late 70s, 80s, um, something about those kinds of neon signs just speaks, uh, it speaks to me. It's um, how I like my animations to work, very flickery, like jittery, and and then kind of a smooth transition. So I, I really like uh, how those kinds of neon lights look. And I, I guess I imagined if we weren't in um, the situation we were, we're in right now, and I somehow was able to make the, the largest um, digital, digital sign possible for the Phillips, this is, I, I knew that this is how I wanted it to, uh, to move. I'm just gonna press play again. Yeah, like the slow yeah. strobing, strobing lights. Yeah, no, it does give it that sculptural effect or, or kind of, you, you do see neon as like that 3D neon sign object, which is very yeah. fun. I love it. I mean, I love how you've also taken something, 
that feels like it could be very serious and very like much within this canon of art history or like this historical overview of the Phillips collection and added some play to it. You know, there is, again, in every bit of your work, there's a bit of mischief making, um, which is fun. I mean, it's a bit of your signature, I think. <laughs> um, well, I, I think before we open up to questions and, and maybe just talk more generally about what's coming next for you, um, I wanted to ask you, just so you've kind of done this, you know, you've created um, this design that captures like the essence of the Phillips collection over the last 100 years. Um, but I think of your work as so future oriented. And so I wanted to ask you just looking ahead, you know, if, if <laughs> I mean, I doubt you and I will be alive 100 years from now, but you know, if you were to ask to design, you know, the Phillips logo again in another century in the 22nd century, um, what does that art landscape look like? Um, how are we interacting with art? How might that logo design change? Um, yeah, I, I thought yeah. it just would be fun for you to share that with the audience since you are so future oriented. Yeah, you, you know, I, I think it's, it might sound crazy to say, but I, I really believe that it, it's, it's not only possible that we'll be living 100 years from now, I think it's, it's something that we are kind of attempting to do, especially with, uh, I mean, you, you watch a, you watch what companies like Disney are doing with licensing people's likenesses and their, their voices after death. And you have the wonder, it's like when you, when you look at a painting of an artist that's, that's dead, you're still having a conversation with something that they created. They embedded themselves in that thing. So I think that it's very possible. I think it would be fascinating if artists were able to make templates of not how they work, but just sort of creating sort of like executable, executable like digital manifestos so that they could kind of pass on secrets to the future. I mean, for instance, like, uh, I don't know, like Warhol or someone, someone being like, okay, well, I'm going to give a hundred artists in the future, like access to like all of my archives for them to be able to create more artwork. I think a hundred years from now, um, artists are going to be doing amazing things with technology and identity and potentially having multiple digital identities that are fused together so that, I mean, concepts of, um, gender and ethnicity and, and, and personness and physicalness is kind of just melted with with the digital landscape in a, a beautiful way. That's what I'm excited to see. And that's that's my prediction. Yeah. I mean, you and I have talked about this, just like how there are certain technologies that, like you said, have have expanded our understanding of like what the physical identity is and then what more of this network effect of identity can be right. um just like the the invention or the technology of the phone separated for the first time the voice from the body right. you know you could hear somebody's voice even if they weren't right next to you and you know the internet now has has done something similar where just as the phone has sort of translated or transcribed voice away from our physical selves the internet is a space that does that same thing with identity, where it's right. kind of, and people now have these multiple identities that exist online, you know, for better, for worse. Right. Um, so yeah, I think, I, I mean, I, at least of how, and I, <laughs> I'm not as, I think quite up to speed on all this as you are, but, but how I'm understanding what you're saying is just like this, more of this loosened sense of what our own physical identity is, or, or just like how identity can be more amorphous. Um, which, yeah, fascinating. Um, wonderful. Well, I think, I think I'd love to open up, um, to questions from the audience. I've seen a couple come in. Um, so, um, I'm ready. are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is a question from, um, Erica Harper. Dom, you spoke a bit about why you chose those four works. Could you speak a bit more about the how? 
Phillips may not be lar a large enough museum by DC standards, but the collection definitely isn't small. Mm. That's a wonderful. That's a wonderful. Anyway, so maybe That's walk question. us through a little bit more of your process. I mean, we can return to the time lapse um, because you did discuss sort of why you chose those four um, distinct works. Um, but maybe walk us through a bit of the time lapse. And Erica, so, feel free to comment if that's not what you were asking. I, the way I interpret it, um, well, I'll, I'll show you. So we have four paintings, Shipwreck, uh, Boating Party, Migration, and The Elder. And I think the way I interpreted this, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but how I selected it from the, from the collection, I went on the Phillips site and I went through a bunch of pages of the collection. So I searched the collection and I pretended like I was just given keys to uh, the, the great Phillips and I just ran through a bunch of these pages. First, I did it by, and this is actually fantastic where the Phillips has a setup. You can search by period. And that's what I did. Search by obviously it has image by period. Um, so you can do something like go to the 20th century and apply. Luminous Live, how oh, beautiful, how oh, modern. Yeah, yeah, so a beautiful way to archive, very accessible. Yeah, and just, it, it's, this is just so fun for me. This is like being a candy store to be able to just run through these, these paintings. And then my favorite uh, mouse wheel click to just open up a bunch of tabs. And then I would just uh, scroll through and just have a few, have a few seconds or a minute just thinking about thinking about why, thinking about what I'm interested in as I'm, as I'm going and I would just take notes. So that's how I did it. Very, yep. cool. Very cool. We've got another question that came in asking what your favorite musical artist is. Oh <laughs> <laughs> that's so, oh my God, that's, come on y'all. That, that, that's like a favorite, like one, if I had to choose well, one. Well, I have a more specific. So what impact did MF Doom have on your work? Wow, okay. But, but by the way, if I, if I had to, like, I'll, I'll give you an answer for the other one. Mm -hmm. You know what? This is gonna be like, if you ever watch, have you watched Dragon Ball Z, Paige? I have not. Okay, that was my guess. But okay, so there's this character in Dragon Ball Z, these two characters that can fuse. So when they, they touch their fingers together, they do a dance and then okay. they, they, they fuse. So. If I could fuse K Trinata and Flying Lotus right now, that's my favorite musician. Those two fuse together. MF Doom. I approve. Thank you. <laughs> uh, MF Doom, his impact on me was, I, I think, the complete person, the complete artist was super influential on me in terms of feeling more open, about, feeling more comfortable about being who I am feeling more comfortable about, um, you know, when I was a, when I was a kid, uh, musical artists, especially black musical artists, there was this stigma around being nerdy and weird and, and liking anime and liking superheroes, even though every uh, black dude I know is like the biggest anime comics fan, it was this thing that they would hide in, in the music. It would come out in rhymes a little bit like, you throw out a Superman of Obi-Wan Kenobi line, but just like, just to be able to, to, take, to take a character and embody it. And this is all back to remixing. I mean, this is MF Doom stuff. Like I am a, I, I, I take from the masters any way I can. And MF Doom, I mean, this is, this is beyond rap. We're talking performance art, visual art, mm -hmm. music, all of that. He takes, it's like he reached into Fantastic Four, grabbed um, Dr. Doom's mask and yanked it out into our world to wear it. It's, it's, it's not cosplay. This is, this is the persona, the concept of the villain. Um, this com complete package, just loved, loved the guy. And it, yeah, amazing influence. I'm yeah. still trying to become more open and bold about myself and my work and, and to, to push things the way he did. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it also just speaks, you know, your, you being influenced by a musician like MF Doom also speaks just like MF Doom, you know, how, how his practice really existed in, in a similar way. 
you're very much genreless or you're pushing the boundaries of what genre is, especially with visual art and adopting practices you know that that come more from hip hop in terms of like sampling and remixing or or mm -hmm. jazz you know it's just it's like the riffing on on what has existed within a certain type of canon and bringing that or even within your own canon and bringing that in and yeah. making it your own anew um yeah it's very musical good question um well i wanted to ask you a little bit more yeah go ahead I, I actually so i'm Sorry, Paige. I actually had a, a question for for Dominic. Um, Let's go. I saw that there wasn't anything in the chat in the Q and A, so I want to jump in. Uh, Dom, first, I want to tell you I love the um, Dragon Ball Z reference. Oh yeah, go go tanks! You got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the go tanks okay. reference. Yeah. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, but you spoke earlier about thinking this this whole concept of like referring to like nerd like bringing back nerd culture kind of in, into your work. Um, really resonated with me, especially um, you mentioned thinking or reimagining like what if Professor X was black, right? Yeah. Which is great because the whole concept behind the X-Men is like this play on like the civil rights movement. Yes, yes, uh, yes. It's especially touching to me because earlier today I was going through these X-Men playing cards and I currently have them on my desk. So I, I thought that was really wonderful for me. Um, but I wonder like how often this idea of reimagining these, what are now pop culture, but really like comic book video game characters as black plays into your work. But, and I think specifically like thinking of like how, if you've ever thought of or reimagined characters like black man, like, like Batman or Superman or uh, a Captain America as a, uh, as, as a black person and, and how that plays into your work. Um, so that was my question. I'm going to disappear again, um, but thank you. Yeah, that's a, a great question. And um, it is a, it's a major part of just my subconscious mind, how I process, how I process art these days. You know, when I was a kid um, watching X-Men and Spider-Man and, and Batman, like I love these characters to death. None of them look like me. They didn't come from places like me, with the exception of like Spider-Man. Um, uh, they didn't look like me or sound like me. I was a, you know, a Haitian American, first generation American. And it's, this is something that I, I think about all the time now. And like, it was, it was kind of a whisper back then, like black comics and like black video game characters. Like, it was like a whisper. Like you would get in X-Men, you get Bishop, so I actually started the top Storm. And then you get, yeah, that's pretty much Storm uh, in, in the, uh, the X-Men Pantheon. You didn't get many of them. And now it's like a, it's a flood and it's just beautiful because now I, I feel completely emboldened and within my rights to just, whenever I watch Avengers, I'll just think to myself like, all right, well, you just, you just completely make everybody black. Well, what happens then? What is it, what's it look like? Is it a black movie? Do we call it a white movie when it's X-Men? Do we call it a white movie when it's Avengers? And it just makes, it makes me think about it very differently. Sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's tragic to think about it. It's like, um, you know, the X-Men are getting pelted with rocks and beat up. And it's like, okay, well, imagine, you know, like a, a, a person with a physical disability in a wheelchair and he's black and he's bald and he can read your mind and influence large crowds of people but he decides not to brainwash all of them he decides to do everything the right way and it's it's super interesting you just you change one little thing you just add some melanin you know what i mean change how he talks a little bit maybe add some hair to his head if you feel like it and it makes it an interesting story batman on the other hand i mean it's super duper interesting because it's like okay well keep the socioeconomic stuff he's still a billionaire but he's black now and he's beating up people from low income, uh, uh, low socioeconomic status, beating up people. And, and it's like, well, why is he doing that? Is it interesting? But there's a conversation to be had. Anytime you do this, there's a deeper conversation to be had about heroes. And which I, I think these are, dem I, are, are demigods right now. And this is mythology. Captain America, all these characters are it's a mirror. It's us talking to ourselves about how we look at the world. 
You know what I mean? So yeah. it's super interesting for me to think about these icons looking like me because it just changes things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can imagine not only does it change the story itself like you're talking about, but it also would have, you know, you could have, it, it, it allows you to reimagine what your childhood also could have been with yeah. those figures that could have spoken more to the black experience. Um, That's a good point. So, it, you know, it can reflect, you talk about how it's a reflection of the world, but it also reflects, you know, ref reflects back. Um, right. Yeah, because so, I mean, so much of like the superhero, you know, m the myth making around superheroes and villains and all those types of stories, that's so much embedded in, in the, you know, the childhood experience or, or how we grow up too. Right, so so the person who is saving you, right? You're mm -hmm. you're a bus is about to hit you, and like who's who's saving you? It's awesome that he's saving you and everything, but like, what does that person look like in that moment where the bus is just like wrapping itself around this person? And there's always that moment where, like, in the superhero story, where you're just locking eyes with this character. That, mm -hmm. and it's like, what does that person look like? And what are we saying when it's like it looks like Clark Kent versus? what if it's T'Challa? What if it's Black Panther? Like, what does, what happens then to, to the mind psychologically? Are we expecting the person to look like this who's going to save us? Uh, and I think there's a whole long list, like a really interesting conversation to be had about police brutality and how we look at yeah. the military who, like, and any authority figure with power who we expect to protect us. I think that's really deep inside of comics. And again, Super interesting com conversation to be had about that, power dynamics and all that. Yeah, yeah, no, fascinating. Um, we just had another another question come in. Um, Dominic, you talked about how hip hop, neon, MF Doom, et cetera, inspire your work. What visual artists do you go for inspiration? Oh, man, okay. So we got the, I'm, I'm ready for this one. <laughs> So this is just obvious. Anyone who knows me, anyone who knows me knows that just Basquiat is like, that's just my, my it's going to be my first. Um, yeah, you're riffing on him today on, on, in your IG stories today. Yeah, absolutely. Dave McKean, who uh, illustrated the covers for Sandman and a lot of the interiors for Sandman. David Cho, uh, yeah. Korean American artist. Um, one more, this one's, a, this one's a deep cut. I don't talk about that often publicly, but Yoshitaka Amano, who did a lot of the designs, actually the majority of the designs for Final Fantasy games um, up till from Final Fantasy one until I think, um, shit, what was it like 12? Yoshitaka Amano, um, incredible watercolor, just, um, these artists all together, you just, you, you smash them together. And I, I'm, I'm missing obviously a long list, but yeah. I, I think primarily, oh, I gotta forget. Okay, Alice Neal, just, just godlike yeah. pantheon of painters for me. Just um, Alice Neal, Picasso, obviously. Duchamp, not necessarily for visuals, but just the, when I think about Duchamp, it's sort of like an iceberg where it's like the painting is just the, the, the tip of seeing whatever's under the ocean of idea that, right. that sort of culminates in that little, that little yeah. art piece. Yeah. Um, so all, all those influences together, obviously so many more that I, I, I probably forgot to mention. Yeah, many visual artists, so many. Wonderful. Well, just for the sake of time, I'm going to jump to another question just to see if we can fit all these in. Cool. Um, this one says, hi, Dom, if you had an art book full of your work, what would you design the cover to be? Since that's really, that's really vague, like, <laughs> I feel like my first, my first, um, yeah, the very first thought, mm -hmm. say what? I said, that's a heavy lift to think on the spot. Yeah, I mean, like, I look at my Kindle and I'm thinking, like, what if, what if it were like a screen, but there's like paper in there somehow, and it's like fused together with the the screen. I don't know. Um, that's if I had like a trillion dollar budget. But if we're talking paper, uh, <laughs> paper covers most most books are made out of paper. Yes. Um, 
I think I would want the cover to be, oh yeah. I want it to look like a computer program. Like I want it to look like, like uh, when you turn on your tablet or your desktop, like paper is not supposed to look like your desktop, but I, I want it to look that way. Like you're picking up your computer, but it's not, it, it's a book. So that's how I design it. <laughs> computer book. I love it on brand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, wonderful. Well, I wanted to know a little bit more if you had, um, just in closing, if you had advice for younger artists or um, artists that are based in the DMV area, um, just in terms of tapping in. I think something that's, that's really wonderful about this series that the Phillips Collection has programmed um, and the Phillips Collection is, you know, such an important institution, both in terms of its legacy. It was, you know, America's first museum of modern art. And then it's also such an important presence within the DC art ecosystem. And so it's so fun to have, um, I think, these cross pollinations between art institutions and local artists and have them be in conversation and challenging each other and informing each other's work. Um, so I really commend the Phillips Collection and of course you Dom for, for you know, this collaboration. Um, but we'd just love to hear um, advice that you have for locally based artists or, um, or younger artists who are just getting started out just in terms of like how, how to break into the art scene here. Yeah, I, I think um, my general advice to younger artists it's like uh i think it's just like relentless relentless um furious chasing of your dreams at all costs um and also this is a little backward but i wish someone had told me this but all the corny, like, so that there's, there's a furious chase your stuff, do the, do the weird ideas you have, but also going to therapy, your mental health, all that stuff, especially if you're black, all that stuff, if you haven't done therapy yet, like that's, that stuff is, it's, yeah. it, it's really paramount, it's, it's important. Um, but in terms of being local, local artists, I think my advice is to think globally as much as, as much as you can, like be bold, and try weird stuff, try all the weird ideas that are in your subconscious that you've never seen, stuff you've never seen before, try that stuff too. But we live, this area is super, super special. And it's not because of politics, but it's because everything, everything around it, it's resources are just all around us. So it's like, if you look deeply inside of yourself and like you'll, you'll find, um, Whatever it is you're interested in, there are other people here who are interested in that as well, but not just interested in it. They're probably creating policies around it. They're probably super, super geniuses around whatever it is you're interested in. If it's clothing, if it's, um, if it's biology, if it's technology, I, I would say to artists here, don't be afraid to use those resources and to connect with those people. You can still be an artist and in age on on that level with, with people making policies and and because they like art too and we're we're increasingly gonna, gonna become things are gonna become weirder everything's gonna gonna get stranger and probably more artistic when this vaccine comes out and then we're all you know outside again i don't know what's gonna happen but yeah. i think artists artists are going to be at the forefront of creating and envisioning whatever it, things are going to look like so yeah yeah optimism i think i think we also forget you know just being working within the art world or being in this space, we forget that art or especially visual art, it tends to be this universal language that can be kind of consumed or enjoyed or engaged with like across languages and across the globe. Um, and there's, there's this, I mean, this constant difficulty with art and accessibility. Um, but I think if we tap more into like this understanding that art is this universal language, it, it can help exactly what you're saying. Like it's that switch that does allow us to think more globally or think about, 
you know, rather than creating an isolation, creating with a community in mind and being a little bit more community focused or, um, or thinking about, yeah, what, how to get messaging across in, in more creative ways where, you know, language, um, verbal language might fall short. Yeah. We might see we might see in the future. Uh, this is crazy. I, I literally just thought of this, but we might see uh, a Congress or or presidents or or whoever who are um, and not even just politicians. But we might see organizations completely run um, using imagery and not even text. I mean, as crazy as that would sound, but I mean, it's, it's possible, right? I mean, like you said, audio, visual paintings and stuff, they're, they're, they speak to something that's super deep, that's subconscious. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think just so that the audience can continue to engage with you, do you want to share just a little bit more of like where, where they can find your work or if they have extra questions, where to send those? Absolutely. Uh, you can find me at domrabber.com. That's D-O-M-R-A-B-R-U-N.com. You can email me on there. Um, that's my handle on everything as well. So yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. And if um, folks have questions for me, you can always reach out to, again, the platform that I co-run is called Art World Escape. And our IG handle is also Art World Escape. So feel free to message or reach out with any questions or thoughts. We always love to hear from folks. Um, Miguel, Haley, I think we'll, we'll turn the floor back to you guys if there are any closing remarks that you have. Dom, thank you so much. Philip's Collection, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. Um, thank you both. This was, uh, I, I, I just sent a text message to, to somebody who's in the audience and I told them this is probably one of my favorite conversations we've hosted at the Phillips Collection and in my time there. Um, and I think part of it has to do with with, with the, uh, you and I have a lot of interests, similar interests, Dom, so I think that there's a lot of connections. Yeah. Um, thank you both for participating in this program. Um, Paige, you were not originally a part of it and, and Dom recommended bringing you in and I'm so glad that he did. Um, you were a great connector. Uh, we look forward to working with you again at the Phillips Collection. Um, for those of you who are interested in this project and this like reimagining of the Phillips logo, um, we are gonna be presenting our next logo and um, pushing it forward at the very beginning of February. Um, and we will have a program with the artist Rose Jaffe on uh, February 4th. So keep an eye out for that. I'm very excited, Rose. Is, is pulling inspiration from our um, conservation department. So that's really exciting um, to, to kind of see all of that come together. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you guys there. Uh, Paige, Dominic, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, and I hope everyone has a great end of your week. Yeah. Bye everybody. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Phillips. Bye, good evening.